Now, we know that rare diseases pose different challenges to some of the more common illnesses and conditions, and information can be very hard to find. Now, our nurse helpline takes hundreds of calls each year from people looking for information or for reassurances. All our nurses have a personal connection to sarcoidosis, which makes them very well placed to talk to patients. And we've asked Jenny, Joe and Rachel to talk now about what questions you should be asking when meeting a GP or a consultant for the first time. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Jo, and I've been working on the helpline now since its inception, which I think was about eight years ago. Time flies, and it really doesn't seem that long ago at all. I was originally diagnosed over 24 years ago and have experienced many consultations, some good, some bad, and some ugly. Consultations can be really difficult for many of us, and I think people get really, really frustrated with the process. This is usually due to unrealistic expectations and communication issues on behalf of both the consultant and the patient. This may be for many reasons. If you're a person who's newly diagnosed with sarcoidosis, you probably expect to go into a consultation and be told that this is what's going to happen. This is the likely progression. This is the treatment. This is the support. But it really doesn't work that way because the disease is so individual to each individual patient. Sometimes patients have very complex symptoms and it's just not a simple one issue job. Many, many issues need to be talked about. And also if you're exhausted from traveling to an appointment, it's really easy. And I must admit, I've done this over the years to just sit there and say, yeah, I'm fine. And not really have much of a conversation about what's going on with me at all. For the consultant, because many of us are not as lucky enough to see someone as qualified as Dr. Simon Hart, it may be meeting the unknown. They may have struggles with their clinical decision making and they may not necessarily want to know, know what to do for the best. Also, there are time constraints on appointments. So somebody with many, many issues is putting pressure on somebody else's clinic time. This really shouldn't be an issue, but in today's NHS, sadly, it is. As we know, sarcoidosis is rare. It's also complex for so many people, and each patient can have his or her, her own unique set of symptoms. With other diseases, these things are so much more simple. Patients and clinicians with other diseases have a mutual understanding of the problem. So as I said earlier, there are treatment plans in place. Support is available. Likely outcomes can be discussed. But sarcoidosis really is a disease of the unknowns, and it's just as important for the patient to contribute to that consultation with an accurate account of their disease experiences as it is for the clinician to assess. I know Dr. Hart was talking about the risk of damage to an organ. Professor Wells has stated that in his opinion, the only reason that to treat sarcoidosis is if there is a risk of damage to an organ or due to the quality of life issues and that these should be taken into consideration. This is where it's so important to be aware of what's going on in your body and how those problems affect you. It's a really good idea before your appointment to get something down on paper or electronically if you're younger than me. I guarantee you'll forget important things when you have your important consultation. The mind just goes blank. It might also be a useful idea to take a trusted person with you to ensure you don't miss any relevant information. When there's so much value placed on a consult consultation like this, you don't take absolutely everything in. It's that emotional investment. You're so worked up before the consultation. So don't be afraid to take notes if you can't take somebody with you. And if you do take somebody with you too, that's not a problem. Some of you may have heard of the patient consultation and preparation tool that I put together a couple of years ago to help with my own consultations. Because I'm the worst patient and I believe the charity are working towards pulling this together to create a document that can be used by patients and adapted by individuals to meet their own needs. The idea behind this tool is that it helps to guide you forward in forming a structured list of information that you will find useful to answer any questions your doctor might have, because they will ask, usually ask you many questions and prompts to remind you of questions you might have. Some of you may have heard of the patient consultation and preparation tool that I put together a couple of years ago to help me with my own consultations, because I'm really the worst patient. 
I, I really believe the charity are working towards pulling this together now to create a document that can be used by patients and adapted to individuals to meet their own needs. The idea behind it is it helps you to guide you forward in forming a structured list of information you will find useful to answer any questions your clinician might have, because they will usually ask you many questions and prompts to remind you of the questions you might have. If you keep it alongside a copy of any current prescription, it will form an accurate record for you to keep alongside your clinic letters for future reference. Now, this may not be applicable to everybody, and we don't know where our sarcoidosis is going to progress, but years in the future, those accurate records may help you enormously, especially in the unfortunate circumstances of maybe having to put in a PIP claim or trying to get medical retirement or even changes of doctors. Um, having that accurate information to hand makes life so much easier. Good history is just really, really good and clinic letters don't always cut the mustard. I've had many that appear to refer to Mrs. Smith up the road and don't seem to bear any resemblance to, at all to any of my clinic appointments, but you know how that's how it is. In the meantime, to guide your consultation preparation, Sarcoidosis UK has something called the King's Quality of Life Tool. It's available on the website, it's easy to find, and if you just put Kings and QOL into the search engine, I think it's the first or second answer that comes up. You can pull it up. It's a real eye opener to work through. It's only about 30 or 40 questions and it really shows how the disease can affect your life. And it certainly gives you something to think about, chew on, and maybe to formulate some of the questions you might want to take forward to your own consultation. Also, the other thing to remember is that medical people have a vast amount of education and experience in managing consultations all the way through their training. They video the consultations, they look back at them, they try to improve them, improve them. But we, the patients, we don't have that luxury. We've got to learn pretty quickly on the hoof. So anything we can do to help ourselves through the consultation process should be considered. And I know my colleagues have got some other ideas for that. The ultimate goal for the best outcome is to be become a partner in your own care. We often hear that people contact the helpline and say, what's the best treatment? What's, what's the best way forward? Um, what's this? What's that? But the best way forward is to form a relationship with your consultant. Work together. Work what's best for you. As Dr. Simon Hart said, steroids are not a medication of everybody. Sometimes it really is good just to leave things alone and to watch and see how things progress. But this is something you need to discuss together so you, fall, you, you move forward being confident with your own care. There are many medical texts out there that recognise that the optimal healing only occurs when patients and medics work together to form a really positive relationship, usually built on mutual respect. I think it's something we all need to focus on and remember that both clinicians and patients alike if I were to give you one top tip today before leaving your appointment, you'll probably find that you feel so relieved you just rush out the door. Make sure you know who to contact if things go pear shape, because sometimes they do. And that's not the time you want to be running around trying to think, who do I contact? Do I contact my GP? Do I contact the secretary? What do I do? Who do I need to contact? So clarify that point before you have your before you leave your appointment and make sure you know what your next step is. So over to Rachel and she'll take you into onto the next piece. Lovely. Thank you, Joe. So my name is Rachel and as well as working as a sarcoidosis UK helpline nurse, I too have sarcoidosis and I've walked an eight year journey during which I've seen many doctors and asked many questions. Before I worked for Sarcoidosis UK, I frequently used their website to find more about my condition and help me discover what questions I needed to ask. With the current strain within the NHS, there's a real need for each of us to become our own advocate. I found back at the beginning of my Sarcoidosis journey that there was a wealth of excellent information on the Sarcoidosis UK website, patient information leaflets, articles to read and patient information videos. Today I just wanted to quickly bring your um, attention to two resources as we explore this topic of what questions should I be asking. 
The first is a clinical knowledge statement on sarcoidosis, which has been produced for NICE, for GPs and other healthcare professionals in primary care. NICE stands for the National Institute for Healthcare and Excellence, and is the Department of Health body that supports healthcare prof professionals to provide the best available clinical care. You may have seen Sarcoidosis UK advertise the, um, the, not the knowledge statement on their social media. You can read the shortened version on the website or you can use the links to read the full doc summary. Working with a health care professional or a patient, this summary is really easy to follow and outline the care, outlines the care that we should be receiving. Um, you know, if you know what care you should be receiving, then it can be the basis for many useful questions. The second resource is a video by Dr Higgins, who is a clinical psychologist, which Sarcoidosis UK recorded as part of the Neurosarcoidosis Patient Information Day in 2022. It's an interesting session on the mental health challenges of living with sarcoidosis, and he uses the last section of his talk to explore how to approach consultations with your healthcare professional. There are practical tips such as practicing deep breathing techniques outside the doctor's office if you are feeling anxious and not being afraid to tell your doctor that you are feeling anxious and why. This may alert them to the fact that you may need a little extra time. Um, I certainly have spent hours in waiting in corridors for appointments and I know how that can increase your anxiety levels. He also advises writing down questions and using symptom diaries such as Joe has just been talking about and much more. You can access this video by typing Dr Higgins into the Sarcoidosis UK website search engine. The NHS website is also a good source of information when it comes to getting the most out of our review appointments. These days, time may be limited, so we need to absolutely make the best use of the time we have. As well as doing our homework prior to the appointment, you may want to choose two or three questions that are of prime importance. If you head in with a longer list, it may mean that the important questions may not get answered if answered if time is limited. Questions you might want to ask could be around whether sarcoidosis is in your body and what effect is that having? Asking if you need tests and why. Always ask when you have tests when you'll get the results and who to contact if the results don't turn up. Jenny is going to talk shortly in more depth just about the questions around the treatments that we use for sarcoidosis. At the end of the appointment, ask when will I see uh, be seen again? That sounds like a song, doesn't it? Um, two final thoughts. Never be afraid to ask if you don't understand something. Perhaps simply saying, can you say that for me again, please? I don't understand. And one of our top helpline tips, if you have multiple consultants, ask for them to be copied into the letter that will be sent to you and your GP after a consultation. It may save having to ask or answer so many questions in the future. OK, Jenny, over to you. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so I'm Jenny. Um, I've been a nurse with Sarcoidosis UK for um, about seven years now. I'm going to talk um, fairly briefly this morning about medication. Um, Dr. Hart obviously spoke about medication already and some of the discussions that should happen. And I think that's really important for people to know that it's your consultant who's going to decide what treatment, if any, they think is most appropriate and when it's most appropriate for you to start it. Um, that might be straight away. It might be a little bit down the line. It might be never. Um, and if treatment isn't needed, um, then that might come as a surprise to some people, especially if you're feeling pretty poorly. Um, but as Dr. Hart said, 
sarcoidosis can resolve on its own. And if you don't need treatment, that's a good thing. Um, so if treatment is needed, um, then a discussion is needed with you as the patient, which again, for many people is a new thing. You might well be used to going to the doctor and just being handed a prescription. Um, and there's no, there's no right to request or demand a particular treatment, but doctors should always be open to discussing options with you. Um, and medication is a topic that comes up a lot on the helpline. People have a lot of questions about it. Will they be prescribed something? Do they have to take steroids? Um, and some of those questions we as nurses can answer and some we can't. Um, those that we can't answer are questions for your consultant, generally not your GP. Um, so how do you ask your consultant? Um, it's, it's not always easy, as Joe said, when you're tired, you've, you've had a journey, you've had a wait, perhaps, you're anxious. Um, it's not always easy to start that discussion about treatments and medication. Um, and the NHS in Scotland suggests using the acronym BRAN, as in BRAN Flakes, um, which stands for um, B, what are the benefits of the treatment? Why does the doctor want to prescribe it for you? What's, what's it all about? R, are there any risks or side effects? Now, there's absolutely no way that any doctor can talk through all the side effects of something like prednisolone. So if there are one or two side effects that particularly worry you, that might be weight gain, sleep problems, mood changes, whatever it might be, make sure you ask specifically about those side effects. As Joe said, write them down so you know. Um, A, are there any alternatives? Is there anything else that could be tried? And the N stands for nothing. What is likely to happen if I choose to do nothing and decide not to take the suggested treatment? Now, no consultant has a crystal ball, um, but they should be able to give you some idea of what they think will happen if you choose to do nothing. Um, so it's, it's BRAN, benefits, risks, alternatives, and nothing. And it might be a helpful way to just talk to your consultant about treatment. And finally, as Joe mentioned, you should always ask who to contact if you experience a problem with your medication. That might be a side effect. It might be a supply issue. Your GP may not be able to help. So make sure that you, you know who to contact. And that's me. Thank you very much. Thank you, all three of you. That was excellent. Um, the tool that Joe and Rachel both mentioned will be on our website soon. It will be basically a PDF download for you to do what you want with. Um, and not every part of it is relevant to each one of you. So um, if you download it, use what works for you. We have time for one question. You did very well there, nurses, in keeping you keeping talking to avoid having to ask, ask questions at the end. But I have one question I'm going to, I'm going to give you, which I think is uh relevant you covered the rest of my questions actually quite well in the presentation so thank you for that but the question that comes up quite often is who needs to be the lead specialist with sarcoidosis so is it determined by the first symptom or the first identified affected organ or something else um often it's um the lead specialist it is usually a respiratory doctor because um, the vast majority of people with sarcoidosis have symptoms in the lungs. Um, but it's, sometimes it's a rheumatologist, but generally it depends which area of the body is giving you most problem. So if you have um, cardiac sarcoidosis, for example, um, and very little problem with your lungs or no problem with your lungs, there is no point you being under a respiratory doctor. You need to be under a cardiologist. The same with neurosarcoidosis, you need to be under a neurologist. So it depends which, which 
area is most affected and is causing you most problems. But if you've got, it's really common to have more than one consultant. And in that situation, it's it's incredibly important that they actually talk to each other. As Joe said, get the letters copied to everybody involved. Make sure you've got letters from everybody and just make sure that they do talk to each other. Okay, thank you. I think it's very clear that rare diseases are hard for everyone involved and anyone going into consultation, doing some preparation in advance is going to make their life much easier and it, it will change outcomes. And of course, it also it gives peace of mind. So thank you very much, uh, ladies. That was really, really useful.